All right, gang, let's take a look at the first of these three observations that tripped up the classical theorists. Black body radiation. All right. They've been observing it for a long, long time. Nobody really tried to explain, or nobody was able to successfully explain it. But let's show you, uh, let's define it again and then show you kind of what the data looks like and then show you what happened when they applied classical mechanics to it uh, and why we were forced, to, not we, but Planck was forced to figure out how to explain it using quantum mechanics. So obviously the emission of light from a heated object, a solid object called a black body. And so the radiation is called black body radiation. And again, we've all done this. We've seen metal get hotter and hotter. We say, oh, that's red hot, red hot, white hot. Oh, right, <laughs> right. And you know what it feels like too. Well, it's based on its temperature. It emits, and so for these metals, if it's a certain temperature, it can emit visible radiation, which we can see. We see it as white or red or orange or yellow or something like that, right? But it's based on its temperature. Well, obviously, if something's a lot hotter than that, it may emit radiation that's not in the visible range, and we couldn't see it with our eyes. It could be in the infrared or ultraviolet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Doesn't mean it's not emitting radiation, but it is temperature dependent. Skip all the mathematics. You can look at the mathematics if you want to. But, for example, let's compare the sun and the earth. The curves have the same shape. It's a similar shape. And we'll see that looks a lot like the distribution of... Um, molecular speeds, right? When we did that with uh, with the gases, we looked at, you know, because of the transfer of kinetic energy from collisions between gas particles, it creates this distribution of speeds, which is a little asymmetrical to the high side. Uh, and it has a very specific, it's specifically characterized with a, with a mathematic equation I wrote on it. We all vomited when we saw it, but showed you why it went up and went back down again. Well, similar scenario here. Let's look at the radiation intensity or, you know, how much light's coming out versus wavelength. Now, here I have nanometers. Let's put my units in here. So let's make these nanometers. And I put a little sub one for the Earth, but it's so off the chart, I had to change the units on it. But let's take a look at this curve. This is called a black body curve. So the sun emits radiation if we go between 0 and 2,000. Most of it's, you know, in this region here, maybe you know, 200 to, uh, you know, 1,200 nanometer range, the majority of it. But there's a bunch of dribbles out here in the infrared region, a small, probably less than 10% in the UV region, but most of it's in the visible region. That's why we can see the sun, all right? And it has kind of a yellowish, orangey color, right, which is kind of the max up here. So this is your 400 to 750 nanometer range. So the, the large majority of, of light based on the temperature of the sun, we can see it's in the visible region. But there's a lot of infrared coming out. And of course, the UV we can't see. We know it's there when we get sunburns and stuff. We just can't see it. So we can slather up and protect ourselves from UVA, B, and C. Not so much UVA, but definitely protect yourself from UVB and any C that might dribble down through the oxygen and then the ozone layer. So it goes up, it peaks, and then comes back out and tails off asymmetrically on, the, on this side. Now, if we did the Earth, it looks the same, but it's shifted because Earth's a little bit cooler than the sun. So it shifts way down at different wavelengths or energies, right? And it's really in the micrometer range. About the majority of the Earth's emission is in the 5 to 30 micrometer range, which is in the infrared region. We talked about this when we looked at the electromagnetic spectrum and we talked about the greenhouse effect, how the Earth gives off infrared radiation because of its temperature, which happens to be absorbed by carbon dioxide, water, nitrous, you know, N2O, those kinds of things, which can absorb it, send a little bit back down and warm the planet up a little bit. Hey, it keeps us from living on an ice ball. That's what the curves look like. Let's see what happened when they applied classical theory, classical mechanics, and tried to explain that. Let's do that on the next board. Big old crap moment. All right, here we go. Let's see what happened here. And again, leaving all the mathematics out. So when they apply classical mechanics, so here's that original black body curve, let's say for, you know, roughly 7,000 Kelvin. This is kind of what it would look like, mostly in the visible, some UV, a little bit of infrared. So when they apply classical mechanics to try to explain this black body emission curve, it tanked, right? It looked okay for a little bit, and then, woo, it went wacko. Let me kind of show you what's happening here. Let's do this in black. Fumble. So when you apply classical mechanics, 
you, it works pretty well in the infrared and visible region. So let's do this as a dotted line, right? So I'll kind of overlap it here. So here's what, if we applied classical theory and tried to predict this before we knew any observations, right? We're like, hey, doing pretty good, right? Like it and it's matching and nice. We feel like we know what we've been doing. Yeah, this is looking good. Wait a minute here. Hold on, guys. You're supposed to take a left turn here, right around the, right in, into the ultraviolet region. Oops. Turn, turn, turn. No, we're going to keep going straight. So what happens as you go to um, lower wavelength or higher energies towards the UV, it splits in the actual observation. It goes up and peaks and then comes back down and goes towards zero. Whereas if you use classical theory, the intensity of the radiation continues to increase exponentially as you go to higher energies or lower wavelengths. What? That was a big oops right there, baby. Okay, so it looks fine here and then shoots. And so this one just goes straight up this way. That's not good. And they couldn't explain why. They're like, darn it. So let's take a look about where Max Planck's brain was going when he tried to uh, deal with this discrepancy here, <laughs> right? Let's make a new board. That was a big, that was, they call it the UV catastrophe. I call it the big oh crap moment that started the quantum revolution. All right, going to get a little wacky with uh, Max Planck's proposal here. So 1900, Max Planck, first first one to propose this quanta or quantum concept. So we, you can kind of think of him as the, who's the grandpapa of all of quantum mechanics? Well, most people would probably say Max Planck. Some might say Einstein, some might say Bohr, but really it all comes down to Planck. He's the one that really pop, proposed this that an Einstein and Bohr took and ran with and really applied it more. But again, he's trying to explain that UV catastrophe. Why did it not work? How do we get that little curve? How do, how do we get it to come up and then go back down again? Similar to, and, and actually, when he thought about it, um, yeah, I don't know if this was his thinking process. That, you know, I'm not in his brain, but I would look at that and go, well, that looks a lot like the curve of uh, the molecular speed distribution for gas particles. Oh, so I think it was Boltzmann. Boltzmann and Maxwell that kind of developed the mathematics for that uh, speed distribution. And if you look at the way the mathematics, and there's a formula I gave you a long time ago. It had this exponential term with a negative in it uh, that caused the math, caused the, the, the distribution of the um, molecular speeds to increase and then decrease again because of this exponential function in there. So he took that math and said, you know, skipping the math for this, he took a similar form and had this this exponential curve with a negative in there with the Boltzmann's constant and all this weird stuff. And he was able to match the form of the curve that uh, black body radiation has, where it goes up and down again and tails off asymmetrically to one side. But this is where the, the concept was. So he proposed that the energy values of a system were discrete or quantized. Unlike in classical theory, remember in classical theory, all values are allowed. The, the energy values are continuous. They, they can range from here to here, or every value in between. But he says, well, the only way for this to really work out with the mathematics is for the values to be this or this or this or this or this. So they're quantized or discrete. A big difference between classical and quantum. And when he applied that that discrete idea to the mathematics, he was able to match the form of the curve, right? And then the difference between it, right? So you got this value of energy, this value of energy, the difference between those, we can call a quanta, or I've heard it called a quanta, or a quantum of energy, right? So if you want a real rough analogy, you know, because remember, they used to think matter back in the day, um, the ancient Greeks, they used to think matter was continuous, right? until um, what was it, Democrates, uh, and then John Dalton later proposed this, this atomic theory, remember the original Atomos theory, where well, if you, get, if you really can look in closer and closer, matter, you can see the particles, and can those particles, are there smaller particles and those smaller particles? How, how low can you go? Well, you can, you can get down to the atom size and that still retains the chemical identity, right? And then those atoms, so matter, which looks continuous, is actually built up of these discrete atoms. Right? So think of the quantum the same way. You've got these energy systems. 
discreetly built by these quanta or quanta. So it's kind of a rough analogy, but you get the basic idea. So let's look at a little bit of mathematics and see how they worked. All right, this might be a little much here, but let's get a basic idea of your thinking, right? We'll apply it to electro. Ultimately, we want to apply it to electromagnetic radiation or light, right? So we can study electron motion and energies. But his theoretical experiment, imagine, you know, you got a surface here. This is your system, and you got some atoms that are vibrating, kind of like an oscillator. So they got a vibrational frequency that had that, you know, these are measured, right? Based on temp, the higher the temperature, the higher the so lower temperature, boingy boingy, higher temperature, boingy 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 boingy, 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 boingy. can measure that with a thermometer, right? To get the temperature. Because remember, a thermometer measures temperature, which is a measure of atomic or molecular motion. So if there's more heat, there's more motion, higher temperature, right? We've looked at that already. And there's tabulated data of that, which he could access. So here was his model to get it to work. The energy of that system was NH nu, right? That thing. So nu was the vibrational fe frequency of the oscillator, right? Which is proportional to energy. N was some positive integer. This is where the quantized or discrete behavior came in because N could only be one or two or three or four or five, not 1.2, not 1.3. It couldn't be continuous. Remember in classical theory, it's continuous. Right? But here it's quantized. That creates it. You're going to see this term N integrate itself into a large majority of our equations we develop from quantum mechanics. In the near future, it's going to keep popping up. You're going to see this principal quantum number uh, n rear its ugly head. And h is a, you know, a proportionality constant that he was able to, using the tabulated table, table of vibrations versus temperature, vibrational frequency energies, frequency and energy, right, a proportional uh, versus temperature, uh, he was able to calculate this constant h, which we call Planck's constant today. at 6.62607 times 10 to the minus 34th joules times second. That's a really small number. You thought Avogadro's number was big, right? 10 to the 23rd. This is like a trillion times smaller than Avogadro's constant is big. It's inconceivable. <laughs> By applying this, skipping the mathematics, applying this with Boltzmann's idea of the uh, exponential aspect with a negative term in it, he was able to get the curve to match the black body curve. And, you know, <laughs> was it this giant revolution? No, because this is kind of the first time this kind of thinking was even required to explain experimental data or observations. And so it kind of started off with a whole hum. But five years later, right, Einstein took this and really opened up the door to people's eyes. So it took a few people to really get quantum ideas really accepted in the mainstream. Um, needed a little more testing. But if we want to relate this to electromagnetic radiation energies, I'll put up what we're going to use as Planck's equation. Let me pop that on the next board. All right, here we go. So if we apply these concepts to electromagnetic radiation, we get Planck's equation where the energy of the electromagnetic radiation is the frequency times Planck's constants. And I'll always give you Planck's constant. You don't have to memorize it, but you probably will. Uh, and then, of course, frequency. So you can see that these are directly proportional, right? So energy and frequency are directly proportional. That's why a lot of people um, like to think of electromagnetic radiation in terms of frequency because it directly thinks in terms of energy, and I can understand that. I still prefer to look at the electromagnetic spectrum in terms of wavelengths, you know, the visible light, you know. 450 to set, you know, 400 to 750 nanometers ish. I don't like to think in terms of frequencies myself, but the problem with that is energy and, and wavelength are inversely proportional because remember the speed of light is the wavelength times the frequency, right? Frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional. So we can isolate frequency as the speed of light divided by the wavelength and then plug it in. So substitute in speed of light over wavelength for frequency. And you could rewrite Planck's equation this way, which is personally how I like to do it, where you have energy as Planck's constant times the speed of light, which I would provide you both of those, divided by the wavelength. You just got to make sure, um, you know, speed of lights, you know, in meters per second, wavelength needs to be converted to meters. So energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. So the smaller the wavelength, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. So now we've come full circle. 
We're going to do some calculations with Planck's equation later after we look at Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect and his introduction of the concept of the photon, and that will help us a little bit later on down the road. So, all right, I oversimplified view of black body radiation, but hopefully you get the basic idea of where these equations are coming from and where this quantized nature is coming from. Let's go to the photoelectric effect next.